Do you want to know the easiest way to do keyword research? Would you like to know how to get your book more discoverable in your chosen niche? Then you'll want to tune in today as I talk to the man responsible for one of the best keyword research tools in the market today. Stay tuned. Welcome to Self Publishing with Dale. And if you want to learn tips and strategies for publishing your own books, make sure you subscribe and turn your notifications on for all my latest videos. Not too long ago, I released a video about the 10 best YouTube channels for learning how to self-publish in 2017. I talked about one of my favorite go-to resources in the Kindlepreneur, Dave Chesson. Dave Chesson is a husband, a father, and is most notably recognized as the Kindlepreneur and online marketing ninja. He got his first taste of online marketing a few years ago, starting with niche websites and the art of search engine optimization. From there, he spent countless hours researching and improving his game to include SEO, website development, social media marketing, and online video marketing. However, it wasn't until Dave published his own books when everything came together. Dave saw amazing success by linking his online marketing skills to his self-publishing endeavors. He created a consistent, steady stream of sales that have made him a consistent number one best-selling author in multiple different topics. You don't have to look far in the self-publishing industry before you find Dave Chesson involved. He's on every podcast, video channel, blog, and social media platform imaginable. That's what brings Dave to the show today. Man, you finally made it. Are you jacked? How you feeling? Hey, great to be here and uh, feeling good. Good stuff, man. I, I, I tell you, it seems, I, I, I've learned, and you know, I'm going to have to put you over here, as uh, some people say. Uh, i got to put you over the fact I've learned a lot from a lot of your interviews, and I remember I discovered you over on Authority, um, Authority Pub Podcast and oh, Authority yeah. Self Publishing. Yeah, and you were the one that actually had opened my eyes to using incognito mode to search for keywords, and we'll hopefully go down that trail eventually. But kudos to you, man! That, that right there, that was a game changer for me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a little nerdy when it gets into the data, so can't wait. Yeah, it, it is really cool. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, search engine, uh, engine optimization, keywords, categories, things like that. So we're going to kind of just riff off of each other here and hopefully kind of, you know, uh, show a little bit more light on, it's, it's a complex process, but it's rather simplistic. Am, am I right in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. It just really comes down to how people look at it. And uh, let's, let's hopefully uh, shift our our ways of seeing how Amazon and things like that work. And that will help us as book sales people to be able to get our books in front of more people legitimately. Yeah, that's the way to go. Um, so a question here, and I think this is a lesson everybody can learn. Dude, you are everywhere at the same time. I, I, you epitomize the, the 10X you know, rule of being everywhere at the same time. How do you do it? Well, actually, the funny thing is, is that I'll be the first to tell you I'm not. It, it happens, but I don't work to be everywhere. I don't think yeah. we really can work to be everywhere because if we do that, we're just going to spin our wheels and we're going to get really tired and we're going to worn out and we're not going to see the results. Yeah. I'm more the believer of the 80-20 rule. Yeah. I believe that for us as marketers, especially if we want to bring the right people to our product, to our platform, to whatever, there's that one skill the one thing that will help us to really get people. And if your product or your platform or content, if that is wonderful, then people turn around and they're the ones who start putting it out there everywhere. Um, in truth, I really don't do much on social media. I'm just, not a, I'm just not a social media guy. I love my Facebook. I use that to keep my family apprised, especially when I was in the military. I was not gonna be calling people from Korea or Sri Lanka. I was just like, I put it on Facebook, let's have fun. And I just use it for that. Yeah. But what was happening was, was that people were sharing. People were putting it out there. They were enjoying mm. it. So it showed that I was finding the right people and I was bringing them to the right content and it grew from there. So for all the authors out there or marketers for that matter, I would say that you find your one thing, you stick to it, you master it, and then you will see every facet of your business grow, not just the one. Man, that's really, really good. I, I, I sometimes wondered, I was like, man, how is this guy doing this? He's everywhere. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, it's funny. I, I do have a team. 
Um, that's yeah. something that over the past year I've, I've built, I stopped being kind of a solopreneur and I have people on my team who have responsibilities, um, you know, for core areas, not tasks. Yeah. And I tell them every day, look guys, we are an SEO company and we are a website. That's our platform. And we're here to help. And this is how we help. So I remind my team every time of that. And, uh, that's why we see natural growth on other areas. That's, that's incredible. Uh, when you built your team, how many people are on your team and how long did it take you to kind of vet out the uh, right candidates for that? Well, currently I have two full-time team members and I have other people who have like kind of part-time or they are, are task oriented, mm -hmm. but the two full-time members, they have a core responsibility. I call one internal and one external. And um, we all kind of work together. We have a team meeting on Thursday where we kind of throw out ideas and, you know, see where we're at. Uh, my role in it is to kind of do strategic thinking as well as kind of help uh, shape. But when you bring on the right people, you need to let them, you know, grow and let them kind of reach out and test and work forward. Um, the way that I found the team though, was that they were students of mine actually. Uh, a while ago I used to do what I call internship and I would bring somebody on and I would say, look, you don't have to pay me um, because what I'm gonna have you do is build a niche website for me and we're gonna get it working to the point it's gonna make more money than if you were to pay me, but you're gonna learn the skill and gain the experience. And then from there I kind of took on my best students. That's tremendous. Well, it, you definitely, you have a solid website and I've uh, really, I've referred a lot of the viewers over towards uh, Kindlepreneur because it's just chock full of great value and it's just, it's insane. It's, you're literally giving things that are high ticket, high level, you know, items. I think that people have been putting a lot of really big dollar signs on that. Whereas you're kind of like, here you go. And yeah. that's, that means, that, that means the world to a lot of people out there that are cash strapped and are just trying to make ends meet in this business. So, um, well, and our thing is we only publish two articles a month. Uh, we're not one of those blogs that's just churning new content all the time. And because we only do two articles a month, that's one every two weeks. Like, uh, I, I really focus and I try, I actually have a couple of articles that I work on at a time. One article actually took me eight months to write uh, because I wanted to, <sighs> I, I did this method, I gained lots of success, and then I wanted to see what would happen if I stopped or if I did this one thing. And so mm. I needed to collect the results over eight months before I'd publish it. Makes sense. Uh, so yeah, but if I had to write like an article every, you know, like three articles every week or so, I mean, <laughs> how, how much can I really put into it? You know, how far can I go into the process? So that's been a big thing that I've always kind of stressed out, you know, with, with, what we write and what we create is let's make sure we take the time, let's test it out, and let's ensure it's going to cover all the bases for the authors out there reading it. That's tremendous, excellent. All right, so let's jump into the, the core of things. I wanna talk a little bit about search engine optimization or SEO. What is that and how is it ap applicable in publishing books? Well, SEO, search engine optimization, is basically convincing some search engine out there, it depends on which one you're on, uh, that your content or your product is the one they should show to people. Uh, so in Google, if somebody types in a question or some type of words, Google then says, hey, this article is the best one. You know, this is what we think you're looking for. And so SEO is the art of addressing that audience's needs and convincing the algorithm or the search engine that yours is the one they should present. Now, the reason why this works out really well for authors is because what a lot of people don't understand is Amazon is a search engine. As a matter of fact, a major majority of all their sales come from people going to the search bar at the top, typing in what they're looking for and hitting search. Mm -hmm. So there's two parts to SEO for authors. The first is understanding what it is that people are actually typing in. And number two is convincing Amazon that your book should be at the top. And to give some of the people out there some statistics, any of those number oriented people out there like myself, is that if you show up at the top, statistically speaking, 37% of all people who type that particular phrase into Amazon will click on your book. But if you rank number two, that quickly drops down to 13%. And if you rank number three, we're talking nine, and then eight, seven, six, 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 and then it goes back up to seven at the bottom. That little uptick is because a lot of people just scroll down to the bottom and think about hitting the arrow, and they spend a little bit more time seeing that bottom book. But again, 
we're talking about double the potential sales, well, actually triple to tell you the truth, of being number one or number two. So does it work? Well, that's how people shop for books. People go to Amazon, they come up with their idea of what it is they're looking for, how to describe it, right? They type it in, they click, and the majority of the clicks, the majority of the books people really look at and potentially buy are the ones at the top. So if you're a new author or you are just starting out or just building your career, or heck, even if you're a big name author, you still want to be found. You want your book to show up at the top. And we authors have that ability. Another way that I like to talk about it too is, and it's kind of a great analogy, is when you're at a party, right? You don't have to be the most interesting man in the world or gal. You don't have to have some incredible thing that you did like climb Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. But if you do know that a majority of the people at that party are very concerned about this one thing and you're prepared for that and you know what to say and you've got great data, well, congratulations, you're probably gonna be the life of the party. And so the art of this is understanding what it is that people really want, creating a great product for that, and then congratulations, you're the life of the Amazon party. Very, very cool. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, you, you've kind of covered a little bit of what I wanted to say with SEO, but where do keywords play uh, in on this? So let's look at it from a global standpoint of fiction and nonfiction books. Absolutely. Well, keywords are those words, okay, that people type into Amazon. Okay. Now, one big thing that people need to understand is real shoppers, as in people who know what they're looking for, don't just type in one word. They don't type in vampires. They don't type in fiction. They don't type in science fiction. And they don't type in cigarettes, okay? They type in exactly what they're looking for. Now, fiction and nonfiction are very different, okay? Fiction is entertainment, nonfiction is problem solving or education. Okay. And in truth, you could say education is problem solving. <laughs> More educated we are, the less problems we got out there, right? No, right. but um, so let's, let's start with nonfiction. Nonfiction are pain points. Okay. Um, I want to quit smoking. Well, how do I describe that pain that is driving me to go to Amazon and say, I've got to find a book to help me get over this habit. All right. What are the words that I use when I describe smoking. Okay. It could be just simply how to quit smoking. It could be, you know, maybe the reason why I want to quit smoking is because I'm tired of having to leave my friends and go outside and stand in the cold and smoke. So maybe, you know, something about the social pariahness of it all, uh, could be health related. Maybe I'm, my mother just got diagnosed with lung cancer and oh my goodness, I need to stop. Mm -hmm. See, these are the things that are inside of people's minds and something is driving them to take action right now. Yeah. Another thing that's important about nonfiction is the demographics, okay? If you say how to go back to school, <laughs> all right, what are we talking about? Are we talking about high school? Are we talking about college? Are we talking about getting your GED? Are we talking about I'm 65 years old and I've retired and I'm thinking about going and finally getting my education? Yeah. Those are all very different demographics. Mm -hmm. And understanding who that is will help us as marketers, book marketers, to present the right product. If you are trying, if you've done your research and you find out actually a lot of people are an older generation and they call and they're typing into Amazon how to go back to school after retirement, then I highly recommend, you know, making sure that your title, your description, and your cover show that this is for an older generation looking to increase, you know, just kind of do it as a retirement thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I bring that example up because I once had somebody who was targeting that and their picture on the cover was of a young girl. I mean, that would, that would totally stop me if I'm a 65 year old guy and I'm thinking this is what I want to do. And you're showing me some 18 year old. I'm like, nope, this is for the young people moving on. So we're going to get into that in a second because the truth is keywords are not just this magical little thing that you just tweak. It's about understanding what the market wants. Okay. Getting the numbers and, and being like, okay, got it. And then making sure that your titles, subtitle, description, and cover are, you know, are representative of that. And show the customer that this is the product they're looking for. You know, we're talking like, you know, these are not the droids you're looking for. But guess what? This is the book you're looking for. A little Jedi mind trick there. Um, yeah. So, okay. So, again, nonfiction. We're talking demographics. We're talking pain points. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing, too, is... You know, another way of thinking of it is time periods or um, emotional states, right? We said pain points. Maybe some 
subject matters are just like so emotional that rage comes into me as I start typing it in. Um, I'm not saying anything about certain presidents, but I am sure that there's a market that has rage over a certain president. And perhaps I'm using anger filled words when I'm trying to learn about somebody and their action. Um, so emotions play a big part into it. Mm -hmm. Now let's go ahead and jump over to fiction. Fiction is not pain points or, you know, demographics. However, fiction is a lot more than just categories. Okay. Some people are like, Oh, well I write sci-fi military. Great. But real readers that love sci-fi military know the different flavors and know the different words. Um, so for example, settings are a big thing. Uh, you could even say time periods. Uh, for the romance writers, a Victorian era is a much different style of, of romance than the New Age erotica, okay? And that brings up another, is the tone of your book. Are you horror or are you suspense, you know? Different tone. Mm -hmm. Are you erotica? Are you second chance? Are you hot and heavy? Or are you, you know, Christian? I mean, these, there's all these tiny little words that nuance what the book is about. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you combine these, you can start to create wonderful fiction keywords. Uh, I'll bring up the romance one again, is that working with an author, we were able to find that Victorian second chance romance was a great one. Now let's break that down. And I think through this example, we'll get a better understanding of, of how this really works out. If I'm typing in, think of the person that would type in that word, Victorian second chance romance. Let's break down their, their mentality here, okay? The Victorian era was a time period where women, it was scandalous if they didn't, you know, have a husband or that they got divorced. And more importantly, if they had children, oh, what a talk, talk about a social pariah, all right? Number two, when we say second chance, right? We are talking about this person had love for whatever reason, and is now having love again. Second chance also means that that person probably has children. So the time period, just those three, well, actually, what is that? Four words simply means that the story that I'm looking for, if I type that in, is I'm looking for the Victorian era where a woman has probably left her husband. Maybe he's abusive. Maybe he died. Um, she has children. She's a social pariah. And she has now found love. And she's just not caring about the other people. because She's madly in love. I would even say too, we could have put something in there to say the tone of love. Maybe it is erotica. Maybe it is soft. Maybe it's sweet. Maybe it's about the story and not so much the love, but there's the love hint. Something we could have done better there. Um, and for that person, once we now know that that's what people are looking for when they type in those words into Amazon, we need to have a cover that symbolizes like society looking down on the woman with her children while she looks to the man. Uh, we need to have a title that embodies that type of, of feeling. You know, um, mm -hmm. we need to have a, a description that truly talks about the pains of, of living in a society without a husband and having children and people hating you or treating you differently. Um, and this all speaks to that market. And once we have that, we've got a book that truly represents what that market wants and Amazon's going to reward us well for it. So as you can see, it's a little different between nonfiction and fiction, but as you can also see, it is very important for both of them. They just require a little bit of difference. And the key thing is, is understanding what it is the market's typing and then getting into the nitty gritty and feeling what is it they truly mean when they type this in. Excellent. Wow. What a, what a great overview. I almost feel like we can just finish it on that point. Hey, <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> no, uh, that, that'd be way too soon. Obviously a little too premature. Uh, I, I love how you kind of discuss that keywords aren't the magic that some people think that, you know, I'm going to get these keywords and I'm going to get first page placement and I'm going to make thousands of dollars. So you're saying that essentially that's not true. You need to have the proper packaging in order to entice the buy. Yeah, that's not necessarily true. And it's definitely not the true, uh, true for the majority. You're going to hear stories of people who are like, I just changed one keyword and all of a sudden my sales jump. That happens. Yes. Uh, but what that ends up being is, is that somebody wrote a book and they were able to luckily find that there was a word that they were missing for their particular book with their particular cover with their particular book description. That's a lot of particulars and that's a lot of ifs. Um, the thing that I believe that's very important for authors is not to write your book and then figure out what the keywords are, not to create your cover and then try to fit some magical words in there. 
It's yeah. about knowing what these words are before you start your process. Mm -hmm. You may find out that right now, Victorian isn't the market. Nobody's caring about Victorian. So your Victorian book, you know, it does not mean you can't write it, but it does mean you can't depend on Amazon to sell it for you. You know, yeah. you've got to go find the Victorian lovers, bring them to your book and then get them to purchase. Mm -hmm. That's a lot more marketing, you know, skill set that you need to be able to find them somewhere else and bring them from what they were doing and make it buy. Yeah. What I am saying though is, is that you may find out that Victorian is not right, but maybe people were using a different word like, you know, uh, 1700s error. Uh, that's where a little nuance, you know, can change the way you make things look. It doesn't mean you have to truly change the story, but it does mean you might want to change the cover or maybe create a cover that's representative of that exact word. So the two mind frame changes that I want for every author listening to this right now is number one is that do the keyword research before you write the book. Okay. And number two is that it is not a one word or two word thing. Broad statements are, are people who don't know what they want yet. And that's not what we want. We want the person who knows the kind of book they want, knows the thing they want truly changed. That's our market and we're ready for them. Nice. Uh, what do you think about using keywords, say, outside of the keyword slot? So, for instance, in say title, subtitle, that's one. And then, of course, within a book description, what's the value in putting that in there? And I know that this has been a practice that people typically will stuff their keywords into a title, subtitle, or series name. And I'm starting to see that um, those type of books are starting to kind of go away. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts? Well, we, there were two parts, right, to keywords. And we said the first thing is know what people want, okay? Yeah. Know the words that they're using, okay? And then the second is convincing Amazon that you should show up for it. Now, in the Amazon part of this, there's really two phases, all right? The first is convincing Amazon that you should show up. The second is convincing Amazon that you should be number one. A lot of people focus on the should show up part and they forget about the number one part. And you guys just heard about the statistics on being number one compared to number two. Yeah. So... Those are both very important parts. Now let's talk about convincing Amazon that you should show up. Well, this is where when you go to publish your book, you choose your seven Kindle keywords. Okay, these are, Amazon says, hey, give us a heads up on what words you think people would type in when they're looking for your kind of book. Mm -hmm. Now, back in the day, that's all you needed to do. That's it. You, you just put those seven in and you show up. But we now have millions of Kindle books out there and Amazon's not exactly taking as much stock as they used to into just that. Mm -hmm. um, this is where, you know, when you have chosen your keywords, it is important that, you know, that in truth, that they be legit words that really fit with your book. Um, if they're in your subtitle or your title, that does help. Um, if it's in your description or in, or even if the words are inside of your book, Amazon scans those things. Um, I think those things affect whether or not Amazon chooses for your book to show up. Now the word chooses or the words chooses for your book to show up could mean you show up book 172, you know, not even on the first page. Yeah. Congratulations. They said, okay, they index you. They said you're there, but now you got to convince them that you should be shown to their market for it. So that moves us into the second part. Now there's a lot of things you can do out there, but the number one absolute surefire way to rank at the top is that somebody types in that keyword and they select your book and they purchase it. <laughs> That's why the Amazon algorithm is there. Amazon wants to make the most money. Uh, anytime you're trying to work with Amazon, always think to yourself, what makes them more money? Okay. Um, in this case, if somebody, if people, if the customers keep proving to the algorithm that, Hey, it's not this number one book I want. It's this book down here. Amazon's going to start to rise you up. So one thing I suggest to every author out there, a quick hack uh, that is legitimate, is when you go to launch your book or when you go to sell your book, tell your fans, the fans you know that are gonna buy it, hey, instead of clicking this link, all right, go to Amazon, type in this phrase, find it, click it and buy it. Now, Ooh. I'm not cheating the system here. What I am doing is I'm giving you an opportunity to rise to the top, okay, for a little bit. It's whether or not your book deserves to be there where it will sit, okay? So I'd say if you were able to convince 10 people to do this, all right, you should show up number one, number two, number three. Wow. Now, 
after your people are done, okay, this just helped you rise up to the top, float up to the top, right? Get your head above water for a little bit. Yeah. Then after that, when people naturally type it in, if you followed everything we just talked about, you've got, you understand that market, you understand that word, you know that your cover has been designed that truly represents exactly that you know, mentality. And your book description really converts and says, yes, this is the book you're looking for, you know, Jedi mind trick here. Then congratulations. Naturally, people are going to select your book. Naturally, people are going to buy your book. And naturally, Amazon's going to keep you right up at the top or move you all the way to number one and yes, stay there. But if you've done this hack and you really don't deserve to be there, you used a, a crappy cover, you're not doing all the other necessary things in book marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just thinking it's a magic word. Well, you're going to quickly float down to the bottom uh, because you're proving that the real customer isn't choosing your book for that word. Mm -hmm. So again, this is not this magic hack. I'm not ruining Amazon because Amazon's smart and their algorithm is really good for them and it will figure out whether you deserve to be there. I'm just giving the legitimate awesome authors out there the ability to get discovered so they can enjoy the spot that they deserve, which is at the top. What do you think, we talked about, of course, you know, you're sending, say, like 10 people over and they go over and they purchase your book. What happens when somebody goes to your book's page and they don't purchase and they just move on to something different? Well, I think that you still are showing Amazon. And again, this is, I don't have, I don't work for the A9 algorithm. That's actually the name of their search engine. Um, and so this is out of me seeing trends and having done tests, but it, again, I just want to put the caveat in there. I don't know this for sure. Yeah. I believe that clicking on a book does help it to rise or at least shows that it was of interest. Hmm. However, though, money is key. Hmm. Um, the reason why I believe that money is key, but not the absolute answer, is that if money was exactly what the algorithm used or the only thing it used, then we would never see any perma-free books at the top. We would never see free books because it doesn't make Amazon any money, right? Right. Uh, but yet, if you type in like how to publish a book or um, you know book descriptions or something, you'll see some free books that show up number one. So I think money plays into it, but not as much as, as seeing downloads or clicks or just interaction. I think Amazon cares that they are making their customers happy. Another trick or another test that I did too right. was I went and I found a book that was like, I don't know, Amazon bestseller rank of like, you know, 4 million, right? Yeah. And I'd found it by typing in a search term and then click, 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 clicking through all these different pages until I found it. All I did was click it. And again, this is all in incognito mode. And then I came back the next day and I found that it was ranking higher. So I clicked it again. And I came back, I was raking higher. And then I did this until at some point, it just wouldn't go any higher. And that's probably because the book above it was actually making sales. So this right here proves that yes, clicking it does help, but sales or downloads are what really matter. And so the lessons we can learn is yes, clicks help. Uh, money is great, but it's not everything. It's just about downloads. And what I mean by the downloads part is, is that if it's Kindle Select, if it's free, if it's a uh, KU, that is a conversion in Amazon's mind. Mm. So the price of a book, I don't think actually affects whether or not people are happy and purchase or download or grab. That's what matters. Do you imagine they'll ever change something? I know this is just speculation on both our part. Do you, do you think they'll ever change that to where they will start to lean in favor of the uh, priced books, the, the things that's going to make them the money? If they hired me, I swear I would make Amazon a lot more money. There are a lot of things that Amazon is not doing that if they just made a tweak, it's not like it would reduce the happiness of their customers, but it would uh -huh. make them a lot more money. So it proves to me that Amazon's a little bit too big um, to be able to make uh, quick decisions on how they run things. I mean, let's look at their AMS dashboard. <sighs> you know, or how AMS works, right? There are so many things where I'm like, it, it's frustrating that they don't do this and they would make more money. They'd make AMS advertisers happier and happier advertisers pay more money. Um, so all of that to say, I don't think Amazon will make that decision. Definitely not anytime soon. Yeah. Um, but hey, if, if you're watching Jeff Bezos, 
Just saying, give me a call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get a hold of my boy Dave here. He's, he's ready That's to right. help fix things. So yeah, That's the right. AMS da- dashboard, I can't agree with you more. The whole rolling over, you know, the the ad spend from one month to the next, that's just maddening to me. I, I think that they should have some kind of a month in closeout, which, uh, by the way, I've said so many kudos about your five-day AMS program. Uh, anybody that is watching this, please go back and review the video, and I'll drop that inside the comment, or excuse me, the description down below, so you guys can go take a look at that five-day AMS course. Dude, it's under two hours, and you have some stuff that literally just blows my mind. Um, so kudos to that. I really didn't have anything else to add to that other than you made life a lot easier with Amazon Marketing Services. Thanks. Well, the reason why we actually created that full course uh, was because we were going to do an article on it. And I realized like after writing the article, it was like 18,000 words. I was like, and then I was like, you know, really like there's a lot of words in here and there's a lot of videos that need to be in here already to show yeah. people this. And I was like, ah, just, just create a course. So honestly, it's, it's a Kindle printer article that was like, the only way we can really help people out is actually just make this a free course. Here you go. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's tremendous. You do, uh, it's, it's so funny. I say this in, in the actual review of the, of the five day MS course. And I say, you do a gentle suggestion to get your KDP rocket, which by the way, I wholeheartedly endorse have yet to actually put up a review on that. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, you were just like, yeah, it's here, but here's the really cool thing. You understand that there are cash strapped people out there and some yeah. people that would go, Oh, he's trying to sell me. So you show people, how to get the keywords and some of the things actually we're even talking about during this talk. So bravo. Love it. It's so awesome. All right. Well, uh, we're starting to get down towards the end of our time here. I don't want to uh, chew up too much more of your time. I always ask two questions to round out our show. And one of them is given the choice, would you choose passion or profit? I think that really depends. Uh, I, I can't give the answer on that one because the truth is, is what is your goal? What is your goal in life? Um, you know, if you're trying to get, for me, when I first started this, I'm not gonna lie, it was about profit. Uh, that doesn't mean it, it, that does not mean that I compromised on my morals or ethics. That's very important. Yeah. But the reason why I was getting up at 4 a.m. every morning before my kids got up, the reason why I was giving up movies and working hard through the night learning this SEO thing, it was because I wanted to be home with my kids. I wanted to be able to, you know, st- stop missing out on birthdays. You know, the military was sending me out all over the place. My goal was so that I could be home, that I could snuggle with my kids, that I could be there for their birthday. And so my passion was being with my family and my means to that passion was by gaining a profit. But, you know, now I I have a lot more enjoyment in the things I do. I was able to reach that goal. I'm now home. My kids are are watching, I think, How to Train Their Dragon right now, which I'm not, I can't wait to watch it again. I love that movie. And I can go do that. Um, So this is all about passion. This is about not missing out on what I work for, which is to be with my kids. Um, and when I, when I, I guess ever retired, then I'm going to start doing a lot of passion projects. So to wrap that all up, I say it really depends on who you are and yeah. what your goals are. And there's nothing wrong with either. Just make sure that you maintain your moral ethics as you go through, because you really can do great things and still not be a scammy, slick back hair, you know, greasy car salesman. Nothing wrong against car salesmen, but just saying, we know who we're talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Totally got Yeah, all, all of my uh, viewers and subscribers that were car salesmen, they're like, unsubscribe. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Dave. <laughs> so how can viewers find you, man? Well, if you go to kindlepreneur.com um, and if you have any questions about anything we talked about today, you can just go to the contact page and hit me up there. Uh, we have over 100,000 people per month come to the website, but to this day, I answer every one of those uh, questions, so. True story. Yep. Actually, I I reached out to you and you were very, very responsive. And to that, I I very much appreciate that. No problem. It was one of the things where when I first started out doing this, there were just so many people that were like great people. And then you would at, you know, email them and I got nothing, nothing wrong with, with them not emailing back. But I said to myself, when the time comes, uh, if I ever am able to, you know, be someone that people want to reach out to me, I'm going to honor that time of theirs and, uh, give back to them. So it's just, something I personally believe in. 
You're a good dude, Dave Chesson. I really do appreciate it, man. So uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your day. I really uh, I can't thank you enough. And hopefully uh, some of the viewers actually got some great value out of this interview. And if you did enjoy this video, make sure that you click that thumbs up and share it with somebody else who's into publishing too. In the meantime and in between time, this has been Self-Publishing with Dale, and I'll see you soon.